Chapter 19 The Old Folks Go North in June of 1857, Harriet was again working in a hotel in Cape May, New Jersey. While she was there, she kept having vivid dreams about Old Rit and Ben, her mother and father. In the dream, they were about to be sold. Off and on during the day, she would shiver, remembering the sad expression on Old Rit's face. She had always wanted to bring them north, but she did not know how she could travel with two old people. All her other passengers, with the exception of the babies, had been young and strong, able to walk long distances. The babies were no problem, light as air to carry. Sometimes she carried them herself in a basket, and she always gave them a few drops of paragoric so they would keep quiet. A group of one runaways could travel just as fast with a baby as without one. But old Rit and Ben? It was worth a shrug of her shoulders. It was with a shrug of her shoulders that she started south to get them, thinking that she'd solved all kinds of problems, and with the help of the good Lord, she'd solved this one when she got there. There was an urgency about the dreams that suggested she could waste no time. She went south by train, counting on the fact that no one would question her because she was going in the wrong direction for a runaway slave. It was broad daylight when she reached Bucktown, Maryland. She deliberately assumed the bent-over posture of an old woman sidling down the street. She pulled her sunbonnet well over her eyes. There was always the chance she might be recognized because she had lived and worked in and around this area. She stopped once at a cabin where a family of free Negroes lived. She bought a pair of fowl from them and asked that their legs be tied together. As she paid for the chickens, she thought it takes a lot of cooking and cleaning and scrubbing to pay for these trips, but it was worth it. When she left Bucktown, the chickens were fluttering and squawking, and she looked for all the world like an old woman. She was not disguised. It was simply that the bent back and the chickens, legs tied together, transformed her into a granny, obviously coming from or going to market. The chickens would serve to distract the attention of anyone who passed her. She walked along the dirt road, thinking about Barrett's slave, and how he had run down this same road with the overseer close behind him and she behind the overseer. She touched the deep scar on her forehead, remembering. She had worked in these woods that were so close to the road, swinging an axe just like a man. Sometimes she had walked here with John Tubman. She knew a moment of self-pity, of regret, thinking of the quilt she had made, reliving all the tender dreams that had gone into the making of it. She sighed. It had, in all truth, been freedom's quilt. It was the only gift she had to give the woman who had helped her set her free, set her feet firmly on the road to freedom. Far down the road, she heard the pound, pound, pound of horses' hooves. She stood still, undecided. Should she hide in the woods? She gathered up her long skirt in one hand, preparing to run. She wouldn't run. Her skirt would be snagged and torn by briars. She might trip and fall. Besides, she still did not know how she was going to get old written Ben to the north. She might have to take them on a train, and she couldn't ride on a train with her clothing torn. It was one of the earmarks of the fugitive. As the hoofbeats grew near, she pulled her sunbonnet down farther over her face and shortened the lengths of her step, edging over to the side of the narrow road, hitching along. When the horse came abreast of her, she looked up sidewise at the rider. It was Doc Thompson, her old master, cigar in his mouth. She caught a glimpse of the heavy gold chain, watch chain of his broad-brimmed Panama hat. She gave a hard, violent jerk at the string of the chicken's legs, and with a squawk and all the fluttering of wings, the chickens ran back down the road. Harriet gave a high-pitched, quavering screech and hobbled after them. Doc Thompson reined in his horse, turned to watch the pursuit. He laughed, and then he shouted, Go it, Granny! I'll bet on the chickens, but go it anyway, Granny! Ha! 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 She stopped running as soon as she heard him cluck to the horse, and when the hoofbeat started again, she turned and walked purposely towards the plantation back straight, head held proudly. She lingered near the edge of the road until it was dark. Then she went toward the quarter, moving so quietly that she was only a shadow that emerged from deeper shadows, disappeared, emerged again. She tapped on the door lightly. Slow footsteps approached the door. Old Rit opened the door a little way and said, Who is it? Caution in her voice. It's Hat, Harriet whispered. She was afraid that old Rit would exclaim loudly, laugh and cry, and everyone in the quarter would know that she had come back. But old Rit merely said, Come in. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. They stood looking at each other for a moment, and then old Rit hugged Harriet and kissed her. Harriet looked at her mother, frowning, 
wondering how in the world she was going to make the trip north with her. Old Rit moved slowly, stiffly. I got a misery in my knees and my back all the time, she explained apologetically. Even on a night like this, I keep a little fire going. It kind of helps my legs. Harriet could see that her mother was troubled by something. She was very glad to see her, but seemed worried. Where's Daddy been? she asked. Old Rit sighed. He's up at the big house. They keep asking him questions. They say your daddy helped hide Barrett's Peter. That he put him in the corn crib and fed him. I'd have never let that worth nothing Peter stay here, and I'd never have took food to him. Food we should have been eating. Well, what happened? Harriet asked. Peter, he took off after he stayed here five days. Then he got scared walking through the woods, and he turned around and come back and told his wife that your daddy helped him. And she went and told her master about your daddy, and now they say he's been running off slaves. The door opened and Ben entered the cabin. He stared at Harriet as though he didn't believe she was real. He said, Hat, you come back for us, didn't you? She could only nod. It didn't seem possible that Ben, too, could have grown so much older, so slow, so bent over. Ben hugged her and patted her arm. Old Ritz said, What'd they ask you this time? The same thing, over and over. Did you see Barrett's Peter? How do you answer them? Harriet asked curiously. I just keep saying I ain't never seen him in the corn crib. And I ain't. It was dark in there and I never did really see him. That first time when I opened the door, it was moonrise and he was right close to the door. I thought there were rats got in there again. I got good ears and I heard a kind of rustle noise. I got a big stick and I went so quiet he never even heard me open the door. The moonshine was right on his face and I could see his eyes. Ben covered his own eyes with his hand for a moment. Anybody would have fed him, he said. Anybody with a heart. You could tell how scared he was and how long he'd been scared and how long he'd been starving just by his eyes. He told me he'd been in the corn crib for two days without nothing to eat because he left Mr. Barrett's place without taking no food with him. I saw hunger and I saw fear, but I didn't see him. Harriet remembered how Ben had blindfolded himself so he wouldn't see her at the Christmas night. She stayed in the corn crib with a party of fugitives. Ben went on talking in his old man's voice. I couldn't bear not to feed him. And then one night I went out there with some hoe cake and a bit of fish and he weren't there. I knew he'd took off and two days straight I prayed that he'd make it. Next thing I heard he were back. He told his wife he couldn't stand the lonely dark and the not knowing where he was going. So he come back and he told her I helped him. So she told Mrs. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, and Mr. Barrett told the master. Old Rhett said drearily, they keep asking him questions about it. Every time he goes up to the big house, I'm scared he won't come back. The master wouldn't let nothing happen to me, Ben said. He said I've been a good slave, and he wouldn't let nobody abuse me or arrest me. But he said the others, like Mr. Barrett, are getting madder and madder at him because they think I got something to do with the man they call. He hesitated, looked around the cabin, and then whispered the word, Moses. Old Ritt said, hush. Harriet said, will they ask you about Peter again tomorrow? They've been asking me every day for a week now. Of course they'll ask me again tomorrow. Mr. Barrett, he comes to the big house, and the master sends for me, and they talk and smoke and argue. And the master says, I got to believe Ben. He ain't never been known to tell a lie, and if Ben belonged to you, you'd believe him too. He ain't the one that run away. Peter's the one that run away. Ben ain't the one that run away and then got scared and come back. Why don't you go ask some of these free Negroes about Peter? Ben's an old man and been on this plantation all his life. He ain't the one that's been running off the slaves around here. Harriet thought, I can see them as he tells it. See the cigar smoke and the long, cold drinks. See Doc Thompson enjoying Barrett's irritation, smiling through the cigar smoke, toying with his gold watch chain. Ben said, Then Mr. Barrett, he gets mad and leaves, jumps on that big white horse and jerks at the reins and goes off, cursing and swearing at the horse, his face all red. And the master and I know he's really cursing us and not the horse. And then the master says, he'll be back tomorrow, Ben. While Ben was talking, part of Harriet's mind was still trying to figure out how she was going to get these two elderly people away from here. If she could get them to Thomas Garrett in Wilmington, everything would be all right. But how get them there? They simply could not walk. Well, if they couldn't walk, they'd have to ride. It'll be all right, she said confidently. Daddy Ben, Let's you and me go outside for a while. Once outside the cabin, she put her hand on his arm. I've got to have a horse, she said. You'll have to tell me where I can get one. It's the only way I can get you folks away from here. A horse? He shook his head. It ain't easy to get a hold of one since so many slaves run off. He thought a long time. Finally, he said, 
There's Dolly May. That's that old critter they mostly keep out to pasture over to Mr. Barrett's, but it's a good mile to their plantation. A mile, she laughed. Why, I've walked, and she stopped. I'll get the horse. You and Mammy get yourselves ready to leave. Pack up whatever food you've got. I'll be back for you. She found Dolly May lying down under some trees in Barrett's pasture. Someone had left a long rope around her neck. She got the horse up, patted her, talked to her. My, but she's old, she thought. I just hope she'll be able to make the trip. The stars were out and the air was warm. She got on Dolly's back with difficulty because of the long skirt and went down the road toward the quarter. True, she had the horse, but she needed a wagon and she would need reins of some kind. Well, she'd just have to borrow some things from Doc Thompson. There used to be an old wagon in the back of the stable. She tied the horse to a tree in the woods near the quarter. Then she went behind the stable, moving cautiously. Sure enough, there was the wagon. So far, so good. Next thing was to get inside the stable. Warm night, doors ajar. She pushed them back and they made no sound. Someone evidently kept them greased. Once inside, she got the harness and she heard a sound behind her, turned. The groom or hostler, a man she had never seen, was standing in the door, eyes wide with fright. They looked at each other in silence, not moving. Then she put her finger to her lips and shook her head and backed out of the stable as quietly as she had entered it. Would he give the alarm? She'd just have to risk it. She went back to the tree where she'd left Dolly, harnessed her up, urged her toward the stable, stopping every once in a while to listen. Nothing. She backed Dolly between the shafts of the old wagon, hurrying now. Once on the, sheet, she cl once on the seat, she clucked softly. The wagon started moving, creaking faintly as it moved. She drove off towards the woods, hitched Dolly to a tree again. Now for the old folks. When she reached the cabin, Old Rit and Ben were arguing. Rit had said she wasn't going to leave without her feather tick, and Ben said she couldn't take it with her. Old Rit appeared to appealed to Harriet. He's got his broad axe, she said. Why can't I take my feather tick? It took me most of my life to get the feathers to make that tick, and I'm not going off anywhere without it. Harriet said, we'll take it along, but we've got to hurry. She carried the broad axe and the feather tick, loaded them on the wagon, and then helped Ben and old Rit up on the seat. She murmured a prayer under her breath when she untied Dolly. Lord, let this horse hold out or we'll never make it. Then she climbed up on the seat and said, giddy up, slapped Dolly with the reins, and they were off. They traveled all that night toward morning. Harriet got off the seat and led Dolly and the wagon off the road. They spent the day in the woods. The old people ate and then went off to sleep. When it got dark, they set out again. Three nights later, just at dusk, Harriet stopped the wagon in front of Thomas Garrett's house in Wilmington. She had got them safely through this far. The rest of the trip would be comparatively easy. Garrett gave Harriet enough money to take all of them to Canada. From Wilmington on up, she followed her usual route, stopping in Philadelphia and then in New York. The pattern of her life changed after the rescue of Ben and Old Rit. It was cold in St. Catharines in June, 1857. Old Rit said she did not believe she would ever feel warm again as long as she lived. Ben, too old and tired to use his beloved broad axe, said nothing. He hugged the fireside and sighed. Harriet, listening to them, watching them, doubted that they could survive the winters and thought with nostalgia of the Tidewater country and the smell of the honeysuckle and the warmth that lay over the land in the month of June, so that the fields, the earth, the woods yielded and held heat in a thousand fragrances, even after the sun went down, the night air was warm and sweet-smelling. She wondered what she ought to do. It wouldn't be safe for them to live in the United States. The fugitive cellular law was still in force, so there were few people in the North who would willingly betray a fugitive. Yet it was a risky thing to do. But she had run risks before, plenty of them. One way or another, she had been running risks all her life. They ought to be fairly safe in New York State. Frederick Douglass lived in Rochester, Jarm Logan lived in Syracuse. Both men were friends of hers. But her mother and father would find cities like Rochester and Syracuse too big and bewildering, too noisy. She thought of the smaller places, stops on the underground, and remembered Auburn, a small town with elm trees arching over its streets and smooth lawns and houses painted white. It was a friendly place. In 1857, she bought a small frame house in Auburn from William H. Seward, who was at the time the United States Senator from New York. The house was at the end of South Street, beyond the toll gate, on land that belonged to Senator Seward. She had very little money to make a down payment, so there was a, la a rather large mortgage. That fall, she was back in Dorchester County, Maryland again. In October, William Still recorded the arrival of 60 fugitives from that area and around Cambridge. 
All of them had followed the Underground Railroad route under Harriet's direction, though she did not go with them all the way to Philadelphia. But she spent the winter of 1857 to 58 in St. Catharines, working in the woods, cooking, cleaning, doing whatever jobs she could get. During those winter months, she was troubled by a recurrent, disturbing dream, which had no meaning. Night after night, she dreamed that she was in a wilderness sort of place, all full of rocks and bushes. Barely slowly, the head of a snake appeared on the rocks, and as she looked, terrified, the head changed and turned into the head of an old man with a long white beard and glittering eyes. He kept looking, wishful-like, just as if he was going to speak to me. Slowly, two other heads appeared beside his. These were smaller heads, and the faces were younger. Suddenly, a, ma a crowd of men came, swarming over the rocks, and struck down the heads of the two young men, and then the head of the old man. All the time, he kept looking at her as though he wanted to say something to her and couldn't. One day in April, she went deep into the woods to gather firewood. When she finished, she sat down on a rock to rest. She looked up and saw a man approaching her. In the distance, he looked like an old man, his shoulders stooped, but he walked with the swift space-covering gait of a young man. When she saw his face, she drew in her breath. It was the face of the old man in her dreams and the same white beard, the glittery gray-blue eyes. Then Darm Logan came up to them. He told Harriet that the man looking at her with such interest was John Brown and that he had come a long distance just to meet her and talk with her. She listened to Brown in silence. He wanted her to tell him the route she had followed on the way north from Maryland to reveal the hiding places she had used in the swamps, the forests, all the secrets she had learned in the last eight years in those trips back and forth through the Tidewater country. He said that he needed this information because he was going to free the slaves on a large scale. He planned to establish himself in a stronghold in the mountains of Virginia. Once having done that, the slaves would rise up and flock to him. He would arm them with pikes and guns so that they could fight for their freedom. He wanted her to join him in this project so that she could lead the slaves to Canada. She also wanted her to help him here in Canada in raising recruits for the small army of men that he would need for his enterprise. As he talked, she thought of Nat Turner, and she was repelled by the thought of the bloodshed that must inevitably take place, remembering Nat and the bloody swath he left behind him that night in Virginia, all those years ago, when he too had decided the time had come to free the slaves. The old man, like Nat, worshipped a god of wrath, of vengeance. The god she worshipped was a god of infinite mercy, of gentleness. Yet his sincerity made a deep impression on her. He was so in earnest. He shared her hatred of slavery, shared her belief that freedom was a right all men should enjoy, and yet she hesitated. Finally, she said she would help him. Later on, she suggested a possible date for the beginning of this action, the 4th of July. While in St. Catharines, John Brown wrote a letter to his son, John Brown Jr., reporting on the success of his Canadian trip. April 8, 1858. I am succeeding to all, to all appearance beyond my expectation. Harriet Tubman hooked on his, her whole team at once. He, she, is the most of man, naturally, that I have ever met. There is the most abundant material and of the right quality in this quarter, beyond all doubt. But Harriet, waiting in St. Catharines, waiting for further word from John Brown, heard nothing. In March 1857, Buchanan was inaugurated, inaugurated President of the United States. A few days later, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney delivered the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case. The court said that Scott was not a person or a citizen, but a piece of slave property that must be returned to slavery. The Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional, and therefore slavery could not be forbidden in the territories. In Springfield, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln said, We think the decision is erroneous. We know the court that made it was often over has often overruled its own decisions, and we shall do what we can to have it overruled this. On November 13, 1858, the National Anti-Slavery Standard, published in New York, made the following comment on a convention of slaveholders held in Cambridge, Maryland. The operation of the Underground Railroad on the Maryland border within the last few years has been so extensive that in some neighborhoods, the whole slave population have made their escape and the convention is a result of the general panic on the part of the owners of this specie of property. Though the, stand for, though the standard carefully avoided all mention of Harriet Tubman's name, 
It was a recognized fact in abolitionist circles that she was responsible for the panic. Under her guidance, over 300 slaves had reached the North in freedom. 